Gospel of John with me tonight, please. The Gospel of John. And uh, first num- chapter 20 and verse number 30. The Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse number 30. John 20 and verse 30. The scripture says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, Father, I pray that you'd anoint your word tonight to the hearts of the people that may receive it, Father, as it is the word of truth. The word of God, not the word of a man. In thy name we pray, amen. All right, you can be seated. Now the Apostle John, as you know, I've told you time and again, the reason I spend so much time in John is because it is, um, it is not one of the so-called synoptic gospels. And there's nothing in the world wrong with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Nothing. That's the word of God inspired I've been preaching out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke for years and will continue to preach out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The problem is how that it is, uh, how that Matthew, Mark, and Luke is used to justify building an earthly kingdom and building uh, building a religious hierarchy on this earth. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke is used for that purpose because what they do is appeal to the kingdom of heaven to do that here. This is one of the reasons that you hear nothing anymore about the new birth. You don't hear anything about sin, and you don't hear anything about hell. I think Brother McNeese mentioned this when he was with us the other day. You don't hear it. These emerging churches and the churches today uh, for in general don't mention hell. They don't mention sin, and they sure don't mention the new birth. It's all about how you feel and about uh, a feel-good religion and so forth. And this is what's wrong. This is what's killed us and sucked the very life out of the heart and soul of the church. The Gospel of John is the only gospel, folks. And you need to, if you don't memorize anything else, remember anything. It's the only gospel in the New Testament that says you must be born again. And I want to ask you a question. Since you must be born again is such an important, powerful doctrine, and is it? How many agree with that tonight? <laughs> Why is it not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? You ever ask yourself that question? Why is it not mentioned? And of course, this is not to pit John against Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm trying to set it for you chronologically. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written in an earlier period of time about the ministry of Christ to the Jews to offer them the kingdom of heaven, and they rejected that. The Gospel of John is the last gospel written about 90 A.D., And when it was written, it was written with the Apostle John having full knowledge, probably, of the Pauline epistles. If you'll remember, the Apostle Paul probably wrote the first book of the New Testament, which would be 1 Thessalonians, somewhere around 30, so A.D., right after the death of Christ, 35, 38, 39 A.D. 1 Thessalonians, the burden of 1 Thessalonians in every chapter is the coming of the Lord. So when God called Saul of Tarsus and saved him and made him the apostle to the Gentiles, by doing that, he literally made him the one who laid the foundation for the building of the church of the living God. He did. The Lord said, Matthew 16, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he used the apostle Paul to lay the foundation for that church. It was the preaching of Paul about the grace of God and about the person of Christ and about who he was in a sense that, that, uh, that it's hard to overlook it. In Colossians, he says that he is before all things and by him all things consist, that he's the creator. He's the one who made it all. And then in John chapter number one, he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And all things were made by him and without him was not anything made, it was made. There's no doubt that the Apostle John, no doubt, had access to some of what Paul wrote, some of his epistles. But I'm not saying tonight, this is important to understand. I'm trying to lay a foundation for moving on. But 
it's important to understand that the apostle John is not writing his gospel based on what Paul said. He's writing his gospel based on the inspiration of the scripture. In other words, inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So this is why the gospel of John is maligned. And it's not called a synoptic gospel. And it's set, in, and it's set under such criticism, far more criticism than Matthew, Mark, and Luke get. The gospel of John is put under a, uh, is put under a microscope and picked at. And this is why the Apostle Paul is called the worst corrupter of Christianity that ever walked the face of the earth. These are the kind of things that are out there floating around in the churches. But the Apostle Paul developed the person of Christ more than any man in that New Testament. Let that settle in. What do you mean de develop the person? He developed his Godhood and his Godhead. The Apostle Paul is the one who said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And all the new Bibles hate that, despise it, and change it to he who was manifest in the flesh. These little words and things like that, folks pass over and say, well, that's not all that important. It's important whether you're going to heaven or hell, folks. Every Muslim out there believes that Jesus is a prophet but there's not a one of them that believes he's, believes he's the son of God. Not one of them believe that he's God manifest in the flesh. Not a one. And most of the preachers in this country, most of the Protestant preachers in the pulpits and their parishioners do not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is almighty God manifest in the flesh. They don't believe that. They don't believe it. So the Gospel of John is written with sign miracles. It's got seven of them. Some say eight. We have the eighth, they say. Some of them say the eighth is where, he, is where he turned the, where he cast the net on the side, brought up 153 fishes, and uh, this was a great miracle. But all agree that there are seven miracles in the Gospel of John, but these are signs. These are signs, you see. They are miracles, but they're miracles in the sense that they are signs. Now, who requires a sign and who seeks after wisdom? The Jews require a sign. And, uh, and the Gentiles or the Greeks seek after wisdom. So I'm going to focus tonight on the, uh, on the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, where a man is born blind. And this man is born, bl born blind. He comes into the world. He's never seen anything. But he is a sign. There's something about this miracle that the Lord wants us to pay a special attention to tonight. In uh, chapter number 9, verses 39 through 41, here's a key to understanding why he was born blind. John 9, 39 through 41. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come to the world, that they which see not might see. And that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words. Said to him, are we blind also? Quite a thing when you have to ask that question. Think about that. 41, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, ye should have no sin. You've never heard a preacher preach on that, I don't think, have you? You won't. Jesus said unto them, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Now what we've got here is a man that's born blind, and he is, an, he, is a, he is a type of a much greater group of people. He represents Israel in their, in their spiritual blindness as they relate to God. These Pharisees thought they were such superior people to everyone else. In the Gospel of uh, John uh, chapter number uh, 8 and verse number 41. Listen as they say, John 8, 41. Ye do the deeds of your father, the Lord said to them. And then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now that was a direct slam in his face. They were saying the Lord Jesus was born of a Roman soldier because that's what the Talmud teaches. Then in John 9, 34, look at this. 
John 9, 34. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? Can you see the arrogance in that statement? You're nothing but an ignorant, blind sinner, and you have the audacity to teach me? I have forgotten more of the Torah than you'll ever know. That's the idea. So what are we dealing with here? Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. So what does that do to them? It blinds them. They won't allow the light that lighteth every man. Turn to John 1. In verse number 3, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And him was life, and the life was the light of of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. These people absolutely rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, and by rejecting him, they rejected the light. And by rejecting the light, then they remain blind. What is it that a blind man is incapable of seeing? Light. He can't see light. The moment his eyes are opened, he sees light. He sees light. The light floods his soul. And he rejoices because now he sees and he hadn't, wasn't able to see before. So the point here in John chapter number 9 is that we have people who think they see better than anyone, yet they are totally blind. Now, they're blind spiritually. But now, let's look at something before we jump ahead. I'll jump ahead of myself here. Look at verse number 6 of John chapter number 9. And look what the Lord does. John chapter number 6 and verse number 9. John 9 verse 6. Yeah, get in a minute. <laughs> John 9, 6. You ever thought one thing said another? <laughs> I do it all the time. John chapter number 9 and verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. Now we've got earth. We've got earth. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. All right. Now he's blind, but he's got earth over his eyes. All right. There's a layer on here that, that, that connects him with the earth. Now... He has the earth placed upon his eyes. He's already blind, so he can't see the earth. But the earth has been put on his eyes because the Lord Jesus is going to teach us an object lesson. So why is he doing that? Well, the Bible says the first man, Adam, was of the earth, earthy. You came, everything that you're using here, this is of the earth. So he's connecting it with where it came from, the earth. He's putting this on the earth eyes that come from the earth. He's using a physical representation to teach a much greater spiritual truth. There's something deep going on here. Now look at this. You take a man today, men today, that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They all have the same spirit. The Bible said it is the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. There's only two spirits. There is the spirit of error and death from Satan and darkness and damnation. And then there is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This is important. Your spirit is your life. That's your life. Whichever spirit you have defines your life. If you have the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, your life is all connected with the dirt that goes on the eyes because you are connected to this earth, because they are connected to this earth. Now, have you have ever heard of the Green Movement? You need to know about the Green Movement because the Green Movement is a very, very important, powerful weapon that's going to be used against you, and it's being used at this very moment, the Green Movement. How many have ever heard of the name Gaia? 
Gaia is a goddess. Gaia is the goddess of the earth. Remember? Gaia is the goddess of the earth. She is the mother goddess. This is where you get the term mother earth. How many's ever heard that term? Mother earth. If you have the spirit that dwelleth in the children of disobedience, when you hear the term mother earth, you identify with that. Because you are no higher than the earth that you came from. From dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. In order for you to ever be any more than dust, there's got to be a direct intervention of the life from above. When Abraham stood before the Lord and interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said, I am but dust and ashes. He was admitting that he was identifying himself with the first Adam of this earth, earthy. The name Adam itself literally means of the red clay. That's what he means. That's what it means. That's what they are. This is where the term Mother Earth comes in is because it goes back to ancient Greek philosophy when it applies to, to gods and goddesses. This is an this is a article written in the Contender Ministries, October the 6th, 2002, by Jennifer Rast. This lady right here sums it up very good. Let me read it for you. Anyone who has studied the global environmental movement has no doubt heard the term Gaia. Gaia is a revival of paganism that rejects Christianity, considers Christianity its biggest enemy, and views the Christian faith as its only obstacle to a global religion centered on Gaia worship and the uniting of all life forms around the goddess of Mother Earth. This is just a little word here for you tonight. Hillary Rodham Clinton says that the NRA is her enemy and all of its members are her enemy. So if Hillary Rodham Clinton goes in as the next president of the United States, I'm her enemy because I belong to the NRA. I joined it when Charlton Heston held up his rifle and said, you'll pluck this from my cold dead hands. This is not supporting Charlton Heston. This is supporting the Second Amendment. This is supporting the Constitution of the United States. The First and Second Amendment, very important. And therefore, I joined on the, on, the, on the face of that. And now this woman comes out and says that the NRA is her enemy and its members. So how could she ever be my president if I'm her enemy? She didn't think that one through. But that's quite a thing. Now think about what I just said to you and listen to this lady as she continues. She says, a cunning mixture of science, paganism, Eastern mysticism, feminism have made this pagan cult a growing threat to Christian church. Gaia worship is at the very heart of today's environmental policy. The Endangered Species Act, the United Nations Biodiversity Treaty, and the President's Council on Sustainable Development are all offspring of the Gaia hypothesis of saving Mother Earth. This religious movement with cult-like qualities being promoted by leading figures and organizations such as former Vice President Albert Gore, broadcaster Ted Turner, and the United Nations and its various NGOs. That means non-governmental organizations. Al Gore's book, Earth in the Balance, is just one of the many books that unabashedly proclaims the deity of the earth and blames the falling away from this pagan God on the environmentally unfriendly followers of Jesus Christ. This earth is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. In the earth dwellers in the book of Revelation, they're mentioned over and over and over again. But I'm not an earth dweller. I'm waiting for the voice to catch us out of here. And they know that. They know that. The United Nations has been extremely successful in, 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 in infusing the green religion to an international governmental body that has an increasing effect and control over all our lives. So Mother Earth has become personified. Now I want you to think with me tonight. What's that mean, preacher? That means that they believe that there is a spirit in the earth and they worship that spirit 
in the earth. You see, they're not going to work a, worship a rock, an inanimate nothing, but they worship the spirit that is associated with that rock or that tree and what have you. What have you got? You've got worship that's connected to the earth, and the earth, according to the Word of God, is cursed. The Bible said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. You'll toil it in the sweat of your brow. Right? We're not connected to the earth. We're not part of it, folks. Our spirit, which is our life, is from above and not here. This world is not my home. So what happens? Since you are a Christian and they know that you don't worship Gaia, then you are the enemy and therefore they demonize you and that's just one more of many, many avenues that they use to demonize Christians. For example, what happened down here in Orlando, Florida, when 49 people were shot to death by a murdering Muslim, not Christians, a Muslim. Yet the Christian is getting blasted. Isn't that an amazing thing? Do you know why? because now they are public and open with the fact that they detest your faith and your Christ and you will become more and more and more of a minority because you are not of their home and they know it. We are pilgrims and strangers. We, lock, we pass through this world as Abraham did looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. You see, the earth is the mother of the unsaved, but my mother is from above and not of this earth. Jerusalem, which is free, which is above, is the mother of us all. And that Jerusalem that is free and that is above, that is the mother of us all, in the book of Revelation is called the Bride of Christ. What's that mean? That means that our spiritual life comes through that new Jerusalem and however God chose to do that and why he chose to do that and all that's involved with that is a different thing entirely but I'm going to accept it at face value. Jer Galatians chapter number 6 I think it is. Uh, 5, 524 somewhere in there. Jerusalem which is above is free and it is the mother of us all. Now that's used to compare an allegory between Hagar and Sarah. Hagar represents the Jerusalem on this earth. Notice earth, which is cursed. But Sarah represents the Jerusalem which is free and above because of her son Isaac. Because when Isaac was born, Isaac was born of the promise. And Ishmael was already a big strapping boy when Isaac was born. And the Bible says that Ishmael mocked Isaac. Now, the reason he mocked him is because he didn't come from the same place Isaac came from. He came from the curse. Isaac came from the promise and the blessing. And so the apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Galatians, says, So it is now that they which are of the curse persecute them who are of the promise. What's that? The earth is cursed. The clay is on the eyes. The ground is cursed. Gaia is cursed. But if you are of Isaac, which is of the promise, you've been blessed. And they're going to mock you. And they're going to persecute you. And they're going to make funny. But that's okay. That's okay. When they put a battle line, they'll unfurl their colors. That's the purpose of a battle line. And when they unfurl their colors, you'll know which side they're on. Well, I'll tell you which side I'm on. See that flag right over there? That's the Christian flag of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Jerusalem which is above is free in the mother of us all. Now Abraham looked for that city and the Bible has a lot to say about that city and it's a beautiful city and the Bible says it comes down from God out of heaven and that's coming. But I want to call your attention to something else that happens over here in John chapter number 9 verse number 7. And he said unto him, to the man who was born blind now, he's got mud on his eyes. He's got, he's got Mother Earth <laughs> that's been cursed, and it's on his eyes. Look at verse 7. 
And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the apostle John says, which is by interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. In other words, if you want to get rid of the curse, you need to wash. <laughs> you need to have your eyes washed. But not just any water, not far, far in Abana, up there in Syria, you know, like the, like the little dried up Jordan. These two rivers up here are far better, greater. Uh, you know what I'm talking about there in the Old Testament when Naaman was told to go dip seven times in the Jordan River. No, it's got to be the water that God sets aside. In the book of Isaiah, he talks about the waters of Shiloh that flow softly. A little bit about the waters in Jerusalem, the spring of Gihon, Gihon. And that's where, uh, by the way, that's where uh, 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 David's son was, uh, was anointed. The spring of Gihon, the water comes up and then it flows through the tunnel that Hezekiah dug. Hezekiah dug that tunnel, flows through that tunnel, and it ends in the pool of Siloam. For a long time, the, uh, the guides would take you to Jerusalem. I've been over there, and they'd point out this little area and say, this is the pool of Siloam. And well, who am I to say any otherwise? Until just a few months ago, they discovered an area that I think is larger than this building right here, a good bit larger. That was the Pool of Siloam, a well-known huge area for them to go wash. They went to the Siloam. Now, the word Siloam means scent. This is what the apostles said. That's important. The book of John, you remember I told you how unique it is and how different. The word sent shows up over and 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 over again. All through John, sent. The Lord Jesus Christ says, as the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The word sent is akin to the word apostle. Apostle is a sent one. A disciple is a follower See the difference? The apostle goes before, the, fo the disciple follows behind. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the apostle of our faith. You remember reading that? He's the sent one. He's the one who went before. In plain words, the Lord Jesus says, look, this water is flowing up out of the ground. It doesn't have a source that man can see, but it's coming up out of the ground. This water ends at the pool of Siloam. If you'll go down there in the pool of Siloam and reach down there and pick up some handfuls of that water and wash the curse away, wash the dirt away, wash Mother Earth away with that life-giving water, you'll see. That's what he did. That's what he did. Did he see? Yes, he did see, and he saw better than he'd ever seen. He not only saw physically, he saw spiritually. Because then he came back to the Lord Jesus and they had, that, they had that dialogue between the two of them. The curse was washed away. Now water in the Bible, for the most part, from cover to cover, is in a good context. Not always, but most of the time water is in a good context. And it obviously and surely is here. Because the water of life, you know what that's talking about, don't you? The water of life. And we talk about the, the, we talk about the river of the water of life. And it's a beautiful picture. But it's life-giving. So therefore, it's not only life-giving, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Water is a type of the Holy Ghost. So when the Holy Ghost is the only one that can cleanse the curse away, and you can see. Now, if you've been cleansed tonight, if the Holy Ghost has washed your eyes, you're able to see like you were never able to see before. And you're no longer blind. But tonight, if you've rejected the Holy Spirit, you think you see, but you're blind. Now come to the last part of the ninth chapter of John, and you'll see what the Lord Jesus is saying to us. Verse 39. For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see, the man born blind, the man followed the light he had. In other words, he followed the instruction he had. And when he did, it brought him light that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. In plain words, he said, I want you to understand that you really don't see and you don't understand. 
And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, said to him, Are we blind also? And here's what he said to them. If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. What sin is that? That's not being sinless. That's the sin of rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Because light rejected becomes lightning. But if it's not presented to you, you're not judged for rejecting it. If you say you have no sin, but now you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. That's when a man is brought into a personal confrontation with God. Salvation is not a cut and dried black and white formula. Forget that garbage. Salvation is a, is a, is a confrontation between a creature and his creator. And that can come about in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different places, a lot of different circumstances over a period of time. There's an awful lot of people that have had encounters with God for decades and they're still not saved. A lot of people have prayed the sinner's prayer time and again and they're still not saved. They don't have saving faith. Let me tell you what saving faith is. And I didn't mean to get off into all this tonight because we'll run out of time, but let me tell you what saving faith is. Saving faith is the faith you have in Christ that gives you rest. And it changes your life. If you really have saving faith that gives you rest in your soul that the apostle talks about in Hebrews 4, if you have that, it'll change your life. Saving faith is not intellectual faith. Saving faith is from the soul. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's where saving faith originates. But you don't have the ability to generate saving faith. See, that's the key. You don't have that ability. You can't do it. You can say, I believe the Bible, that's good. You accept it intellectually, that's great. You ought to believe it because it's true, every word. But to believe in the one who went to the cross and gave himself for you to be born again is a work of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When he is come into the world, John 16, he will convince the world of sin because they believe not on me. The work of the Holy Spirit of God is to take the mud off of the eyes and open them up and you see the Son of God for who He is and yourself for what you are and you embrace Him as your Savior. However you do it, that's your business. But you've received Him and you're trusting Him and you're believing on Him and now you see. But you can only see because God opened your eyes. If you think you see and your eyes haven't been opened, you're in the same shape the Pharisees are in. And you're in the same shape that most of the religious people in this country and most of the reverends standing in the pulpit are. They think they see and they're blind as a bat. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you'd bless the study of your word. I pray you'd bless it to the hearts of the people. It's good seed, Lord. We've sowed good seed tonight. We may have simply watered tonight what some other brother or someone else has sowed in time past. It makes no difference who sows or who waters, but it's you that give the increase. And I'm happy at that, Father. I pray in Jesus' name tonight now that you glorify your blessed Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we see him for who he is. He is salvation, and there is none apart from him. There is nothing apart from him. He is everything. If he's not everything, he's nothing. In Jesus' sweet holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.